Okay, welcome back to Midnight Tutor. Yet another problem, this time dealing with slope fields. I hope to exhaust the subject of slope fields and separable differential equations in this short tutorial. As always, if you have problems you can't solve, send them to solve at midnighttutor.com. Get ready for our AP Calculus Review tutorial set, which will be coming out soon. Okay, let's get started here. The problem statement, graph the following differential equation, sketch a few solutions, and then find the general solution analytically. And the equation is dy dx equals minus 4x divided by y. So the first thing is the slope field. Now let's think for a second about what's the, what's the theory behind this? Where does this come from? What does this equation represent? Well, we have dy dx, which we have been taught since day one of calculus, represents slope. Slope of the function y, right? y is a function of x. And we're saying that the slope at some point, x, y, is governed by this formula. So you can see that as the function moves, right, at different places in the plane, the slope is going to be different. And slope is just how steep or not steep is a line, right, a tangent line. So we have the slope as we move around this thing is going to vary somehow. It's not always going to be the same steepness. Well, this gives us a recipe, so to speak, for what that looks like. Now, the ultimate answer is, what is this function f of x that has this property, right? Because that's something we can use in life. If you're building your sewage system and you want to make sure it doesn't overflow, you're building your airplane, you want to make sure the wing loading doesn't get too high, etc. You started your own hedge fund and you want to make sure your positions don't get out of hand. The same principles apply in all cases. So we have a recipe here for the slope at any point for this function f of x. So now the first thing is to graph it. Maybe that'll give us some idea of what we're looking at, especially then if you graph it and then kind of squint at the paper, you can see sort of these little trends. It kind of has a, a sort of Van Gogh-like quality to it. So this is unfortunately one area where neatness does count, which is not good for me, but I will try to be as neat as possible. What I'm going to do is draw a nice big Cartesian plane here. Usually on any test, they've already given this part to you, so you don't have to worry about it. And I'm going to go, I'm going to go from uh, 5 to minus 5 in each direction. So now you can see I have 11 tick marks this way, including the origin, 11 tick marks this way, including the origin. So I have an array here, I have a grid, and I'm just going to fill in, I'm just put a little dot at each of these integer intermediate points. And remember, we have our, now here we have all our dots, Remember the axes also, where the tick marks are, there should be dots there as well. Now I'm just going to go through, I'm going to use my formula, minus 4x over y, and I'm going to draw little slope lines at each of these dots. Let's start with a possibly simple or possibly not simple location, the point 0, 0. Now at 0, 0, we have 4 times 0 divided by 0, which is an undefined form, so we have no slope at 0, 0. We'll just leave that empty. How about this point here? This is x equals 1, y equals 0. So we have here, let me, I'll just draw a little, right, this is, this is the point 1, 0. So therefore the slope is going to be minus, minus 4 times 1 divided by 0. Well, that's still not good. 
we still have nothing to define. So I'm going to leave that empty. Now, in fact, the entire x-axis has y values of 0. And so the entire x-axis is going to have no slope. So we just killed 11 points right off the bat there. So now let's look at the y-axis. Right In the case of the y-axis, x is always 0. Well, for any value of x being z x is always 0, no matter what y is, this is always going to be 0. And remember that a slope of 0 is a horizontal line. So I can say this is going to be horizontal, this is horizontal, this is horizontal, this is horizontal, this is horizontal. So there's another 11 points down. Now let's go to this point here. This is 1, 1. So we have minus 4 times 1 divided by 1, which is minus 4. So the 4 is rather steep, but the minus sign means that it's going to be not angled this way, but that way. right? And so it means that for up, we go up 4 for over 1. Well, here's 1, 2, 3, 4, and here's 1. So it's going to be a pretty steep slope. right? If I kind of drew the whole line and it would kind of go like that, I just want a little piece here. So that's 1, 1. Now here's 2, 1. Minus 4 times 2 is 8 divided by 1. That's even steeper, right? So you can see that as we go out here, the thing gets steeper and steeper. Now what about this? This is minus 1, 1. So we have 4 times minus 1 divided by 1, which is going to give us a positive 4. So it's going to be a mirror image of this, right? This is pretty steep and they get even steeper as we go out. Now what about this line down here? The minus, this point is minus, is as one minus one. So here we have four times one divided by minus one is gonna give us a positive four value. Which is pretty steep, right? And I think we're gonna see the same trend as we go out here. Right, this, is, this point is two minus one, so we have eight divided by 1, it's even more steep. And then obviously this row is going to be the mirror image of that. So we start out with some steepness and then it gets even more steep as we move further out. Now let's look at the point here. This is x equals 1, y equals 2. 4 times 1 is 4 divided by 2 is 2, so it's less steep, right? It's still negative, but it's less steep. But here again, as we go out, as the x values get bigger, it's going to get more steep. So we can just kind of approximate this. Right now, this point is only going to be half as steep as that point. And then here in the third row, we have divided by y equals 3, so they're getting smaller. So this is going to be even more shallow. These are going to be even more shallow. And then even more shallow. So that kind of gives you a trend. Now, I submit that just the way these other things are mirror images, the whole pattern continues that way. You, you can satisfy yourself of that if you need to. So I'm just going to kind of draw these things in here. This is less steep, getting a little bit more steep. More shallow, getting a little bit more steep. More shallow, getting a little bit more steep. More shallow, getting a little bit more steep. And then the same thing here, right? So a little less steep, getting, getting more steep. Whoops. Less steep, getting a little bit more steep. Less steep, getting a little bit more steep. Less steep. And then this quadrant. Right, so the whole thing to making this happen is to recognize that when you have a larger number on top and a smaller number on the bottom, it's going to be more steep, more vertical, either this way if it's plus or this way if it's minus. As the numbers on the bottom get bigger, then it gets more shallow. So you can kind of approximate it. So now we have all these different things in here already. So now we kind of have to lose, use our, our Van Gogh-like analysis and kind of squint at the thing. And you can see sort of this swirling motion, right? And in fact, 
it says now, sketch a few solutions. So what we want is a function f that's going to satisfy all these different slope conditions as it goes through those points. And so we can kind of generalize a little bit. We can see that maybe there's something here, something here, something here, something here. So you can kind of see this pattern, right? Now I'm drawing circles. It remains to be seen whether this is actually correct or not, but it kind of does have this circular quality to it. The problem is that these slopes are, are much finer here, so we don't... It's not exactly circular, right? It's round, but it may not be purely circular. Good enough for the purposes of this analysis. And these are all valid solutions, because we always, when we do integrals, we have this thing called C, which can be any number, so there's multiple possibilities here. Now let's solve it analytically and see if we come up with something that resembles this. So I have dy dx is minus 4x over y. What do I do with this? Well, a long time ago, somebody came up with this concept called separation of variables, a separable differential equation. Now, let me say a few words about that, first of all. If I just have some generic equation, and I want to solve it, can I go in and just take the derivative of both sides? and say, okay, I'm just going to take the derivative of this whole thing. It's an equation after all. And then I end up with 6x plus 5 equals 0. No, that is not possible. That is not valid. That violates the principles of mathematics. You just cannot randomly take a derivative of an equation, right? The same thing is true. You can't take an integral of both sides of an equation in a general way. That's invalid, right? The equation says that things are equal. It doesn't say that their slopes are equal or whatever else. Totally invalid. So then why, in the case of a separable differential equation, can we do just that, integrate both sides? Well, essentially what we're doing is we're using the chain rule and substitution, but it's behind the scenes. I'll go through this maybe at the end. I don't want to bore you with the details which are not important for you getting from your own point A to point B, which is to learn calculus and appreciate the concepts. But I think if you understand what's behind it, it makes it less of a science from outer space where things just kind of appear like asteroids. They just drop in. And it makes it more like a story that has a plot and it has characters and a goal and so on and so forth. So I encourage you to watch the ending part of this video when I kind of go through that. Nevertheless, what we can do now is we want to move everything with x's to one side, including the things with dx's, right? And as far as we're concerned, dx is some thing. We call it a differential. We want everything with x's on one side, everything with y's on the other. So you can see I'm going to move the, the dx over here, so I have minus 4x dx, and if I move the y over here, I have y dy. Okay, reasonable. That's just algebra. So now we say, okay, because what we originally had was a derivative, what we want to do is undo the derivative using the chain rule, hence we're going to integrate both sides, right? Only, this is only valid here because we're undoing the derivative. We just, in general, cannot integrate both sides of an equation. And then what do I get? Well, I get integral of y dy is y squared plus c. But I have a c over here, so I'm going to combine my c's. And here I have minus 4x squared over 2, y squared over 2 minus 4x squared over 2 plus c. OK. Now we can multiply through by 2, and 2c is an, uh, just another c, and we can end up with here y squared, and I'll move the x squared over to this side, plus 4x squared equals c. So that's the general solution to this equation. What is this? Well, we know right off the bat, we from analytic geometry, what this is. It's an ellipse. And how do we know that? Well, we have its y squared term and an x squared term 
we don't have any x or y terms, or if we did, if we did, we don't have one of each. But the co coefficient of the y squared and the coefficient of x squared are not the same, right? There's a four here. There's only a one here. So it's not a circle. It's an ellipse. So now I would have to go back and on the test, I would say, aha, now that I found this out, let me take my sloppy drawing and update it to make it correct. So an ellipse is something where it's longer on one axis than the other. It's still round. So we were in the, we had the general idea correct. Let me use a different color here, blue. But in reality, they're going to be oblong. Now the question is, which axis are they longer on? Well, the general form for an ellipse formally is x squared over m squared plus y squared over n squared equals 1. And then m is the length of the major axis and n is the length of the minor axis. So if we were to try to do this the, the same way we would have, we would have uh, y squared over 4 plus x squared over 1 equals c, right? So these things are going to be longer on the x dimension. So in reality, instead of being circular, they should be more like this. They should look like footballs. Footballs that go this way. Now, how do I know that? Notice how it's more, things are more steep out here, but they're flatter here. So it has to be that way, right? Because an ellipse, if I just look at a little piece of an ellipse, right, it's steep here and it's flat here. So we're, what we really have are little footballs, but there's an infinite number. They're all centered at zero, zero. The C value just tells us which one, how big it is. Okay, I hope this made sense, and keep up the good work.